Great. Well, hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, also known as CCAST. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. For anyone unfamiliar, uh, CCAST is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species. CCAST supports different communities of practice including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020. If you would like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, feel free to email myself, Christy, or Matt Graba. Um, it looks like Christy just dropped those emails in the chat there, Mom, so thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Christy to talk a little bit more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Carly, and welcome everyone. Uh, for those I don't know, my name is Christy Miner. I am the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. Webinars like this are just one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And today we're very excited to host a presentation from Scott Durst, who will talk about managing non-native fish in the San Juan River. Scott works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as the science coordinator for the San Juan River Basin Recovery Implementation Program. This recovery program is a collaborative effort to recover Colorado pike minnow and razorback sucker while water development occurs within the San Juan River Basin. Again, just a final reminder before I turn it over to our presenter, if you have questions during the presentation, go ahead and enter those into the chat box and we'll relay those to the speaker after the presentation uh, if we have time. And with that, Scott, I think we are ready for your presentation. So take Great. it away. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, Carly. So again, as Christy said, I, my name is Scott Durst. I work for the, the Fish and Wildlife Service office that, that manages the San Juan Recovery, Recovery Implementation Program. And um, I just want to highlight that um, a lot of San Juan Recovery Program partners and collaborators contributed to the data and the analysis that I'll be presenting today, including um, other Fish and Wildlife Service offices, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, Navajo Nation Fish and Wildlife and Kansas State University. And you know, for those of you who have read the case study um, that we put together on non-native fish management in the San Juan, San Juan River, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk in more detail about this because there's lots of nuances and details um, that we really weren't able to capture in that case study. So again, I appreciate the, the opportunity to kind of go um, and give a deep dive on this topic, this topic today. Um, and again, what, what I what I kind of want to cover today is is you know where the San Juan Recovery Program has been in terms of non-native fish management, um, and then kind of wrap up with where we are now, and then where we might go into the future. And as as some of you, I see a few names on the, the participant list. That some folks are might have a little more familiarity with the, the recovery program, but it's been a pretty hot topic over the last several years as as we discussed how to assess the impact and the threat of non-native fish management, and then the goals and path forward we have with this management action. So just real briefly, I'll, I'll provide a brief um, overview of the San Juan Recovery Program, and kind of, I guess, reiterating some of the things Christy mentioned um, in, in her, in her um, introduction there. But for the bulk of the presentation, what I, what I wanna do is kind of share some information that we've learned over the last 20 years of non-native fish management in the San Juan River. And that some of that um, um, assessment effort started um, covering the period 2001 to about 2015, as removal efforts were expanding both spatially and temporally in um, in the system and increasing in intensity as well. And those efforts were were captured in um, a France and et al. 2014 paper that attempt to assess um, the effects of removal on non-native and native species. After that um, work, we conducted a two-year um, control treatment um, experiment to, to, to more precisely affect the assess, or for more, to more precisely evaluate the, the effect of, of non-native 
um, removal on both the non-native target species and um, native species in the San Juan River. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go into some work that was um, headed up by uh, Casey Pennock out of Utah State University on, to try to understand how channel catfish responded to non-native removal at a population level. We, we did a, um, some modeling work to, to, to suss that out. Um, and then more recently, we've tried to increase the efficiency of our non-native fish management efforts by shifting some removal work into the winter um, in 2020 and 2021 when we thought sampling conditions would be more conducive to, um, to having a bigger effect on the, on the catfish population. And then finally, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up um, this overview of all this work that's been done with a channel catfish predation study um, conducted in 2018 and 2019 by, um, by Skylar Hedden that we, we took the, the results of that diet study and extrapolated the, um, the impacts of channel catfish predation to age one um, Colorado pike minnow. And then finally, I'll just kind of wrap up with, with um, you know, what the San Juan Recovery Program is, is doing with this information and kind of like the, the, the path forward we have based off that. And again, um, and then again, thanks Christy for that, that overview of the San Juan um, Recovery Program. And I'll use, I'll use SJ RIP, San Juan Recovery Program, Recovery Program, Program interchangeably just to talk about um, that, that collaborative program. That collaborative program. And, and the, the San Juan Recovery Program was formed because of the threat posed by the Animus La Plata Water Development Project on the continued existence of Colorado pike minnow and razorback sucker in the San Juan River Basin. And then the goals of this recovery program were to conserve and recover both those species while water development occurred within the San Juan River Basin in compliance with federal and state laws, interstate compacts, court decrees, and then the federal tribal trust responsibilities. And again, as Christy mentioned, this, the San Juan Recovery Program is a collaborative program made up of federal agencies that include the Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Reclamation, Bureau of Land Management, Land Management, excuse me, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It includes the states of New Mexico and Colorado and soon to include Utah. And it also includes um, four tribes in the Four Corners area, the Navajo Nation, the Southern Ute Indian Tribe, Hickory Apache Nation, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, and also finally includes some non-government partners representing water users and conservation interests. So just kind of for the spatial context, for those who aren't familiar, the San Juan River is the second largest tributary um, to the Upper Colorado River. And the San Juan runs from southwestern Colorado through northwestern Utah and into southeastern excuse me, northwestern New Mexico through southeastern Utah before it empties into, into Lake Powell. The recovery program's uh, management activities primarily occurred downstream of Navajo Reservoir down into the um, San Juan arm of Lake Powell and, and then in some cases include some work in, in tributaries. The recovery program has conducted lots of research, monitoring and management activities over the years, but it has four major recovery um, actions to promote um, recovery for the endangered fish. And those have been flow management through the reoperation of Navajo Reservoir, providing fish passage, stocking hatchery reared fish, and non-native removal. And I'll just briefly touch on these other um, management activities before diving into non-native fish management. So through the collaboration with the San Juan Recovery Program, the Bureau of Reclamation has reoperated Navajo Reservoir to mimic a natural flow regime to cue biological responses for the endangered fish and also to create and maintain habitats for all life stages of these fish. And this graphic here, um, it shows mean daily discharge at, uh, near bluff by day of year and that the blue line The, the blue line uh, represents the hydrograph uh, pre-dam. So again, low base flows characterized by, by high spring runoff um, was typical of, of a lot of these, these rivers in the Southwest pre-dam. The, the red dotted line represents the hydrograph during um, the period of, of Navajo Dam being operated for its, its, its intended purposes. And then in 1992, after the recovery program was formed, 
we developed these flow recommendations that called for certain flows um, at certain times of the year and at certain magnitudes and certain yearly frequencies to benefit the endangered fish. And, and um, that's in that mustard, uh, mustard color there. And then um, since 1998, we've attempted to implement those flow recommendations um, in that green hydrograph. And you can see that that green hydrograph is a fair bit lower than the hydrograph during the period of development. And, and um, that's largely due to the effects of this ongoing um, drought and dry hyd hydrology that we've had over the last 20 or so years that have really limited our ability to achieve the high spring flows that we desire at the, at, at the frequency that we'd like to see in the system. Um, another major management activity is um, the removal and modification of barriers to fish movement to allow passage and access to habitats that would other, otherwise be unavailable. And this, this here is PNM weir and fish passage, one example of, of one of those efforts to um, allow fish passage. So this is the San Juan River flowing from um, the bottom right to the top left of the, of the screen. This is near Farmington, New Mexico. There's a, um, a diversion weir that spans the entire river for a power plant. And then in 2002 or 2003, the recovery program conducted or constructed this uh, fish, fish passage here on river left to allow fish to um, navigate from um, downstream through the passage upstream to um, avoid the weir. And these, um, these red um, bars represent pit tag antennas that we've installed more recently to evaluate the effects of this, of this um, management action. And then just to kind of plug um, a future CCAST presentation, my colleague Mark McKinstry will be speaking in um, December about uh, some ongoing work at Paiute Farms Waterfall um, further downstream in the San Juan River to, pro to provide, provide fish passage at that location. Um, another major uh, activity of the recovery program is, is um, a successful hatchery augmentation program that's increased the size of these nearly extirpated popula adult populations for both endangered fish. And then these, these two panels are ones, the top one is for razorback sucker, the bottom one is for Colorado pike minnow, and, and um, there are the cumulative number of uh, endangered fish stocked in the San Juan River over time. So the, the results of this stocking effort has um, greatly increased the adult populations of both of these endangered fish. Both of these fish reproduce um, in the wild on a, on a regular basis, but, but still we're having trouble um, completing that last part of the life cycle where those adult fish successfully, uh, those adult fish produce offspring that successfully recruit um, in the wild, but we're kind of lacking that life stage still. And there's lots of ongoing work to, to try to uh, um, alleviate some of those recruitment bottlenecks. And then finally, non-native fish management via raft-mounted electrofishing has, has sort of been a foundational management activity of the recovery program that's, that was intended to reduce the negative interactions between non-native fish and um, the endangered fish we're trying to recover in the system through predation and competition. And channel catfish has been the primary target of these efforts as it's been the first or second most abundant large-bodied fish in, in, in many, um, many stretches of the San Juan River. However, this, um, this management action has been contentious, especially more recently in the San Juan River um, recovery program because it's high cost, it's potential to have negative interact negative consequences of extensive electrofishing on the endangered fish, and also because of the apparent inability to crash the channel catfish population. So, so we've started what's become a long-term effort to evaluate the effects of non-native fish management in the San Juan River. And then what I'll I'll spend the next oh handful of slides going through is kind of provide an overview of publications and reports that cover the recovery program's efforts to assess its non-native management efforts, um, re some research on the response of natives and non-natives to that management, and then kind of wrap up with some predation impacts of channel catfish. And um, if there's anybody who, who, who uh, needs to be directed to any of these publications, I'd be happy to provide them after the presentation today. And, and honestly, you know, any of these any of these um, papers I cover, you know, really deserves its own presentation, but I'll just 
try to provide the gist of that work just so folks can understand where the recovery program stands today with respect to that management action and how we're trying to move forward. So prior to, to 2016, we um, did a, re a retrospective an analysis of, of, the, of the program's um, non-native fish management to that date. And this graphic represents the spatial and temp temporal variation in the implementation of intensive non-native fish removal in the San Juan River from 20, 2001 to 2012. So we have, again, year along the, um, the y-axis here and then a river kilometer along the x. So, like, so zero represents um, down at the waterfall, most downstream, and then the, the, the increasing river kilometers represent further upstream locations in the San Juan River. These, um, these black horizontal lines represent the reaches that received um, intensive removal. And so like, so for example, in, in this reach here downstream of oh, River Kilometer 60 or so, they started doing um, removal in this section of the river. Removal in this middle section of the river wasn't implemented until 2006. So the black bars just represent the year when, when we started removing in that reach. These letters down here at the bottom represent some the subreaches we use in the analysis that I'll talk about a little bit later. And then these numbers above the bars here represent the number of electrofishing passes that were conducted in that specific reach. And then, and then we've considered a pass as two electrofishing electro rafts sampling perpendicular, perpendicular on each side of the shore. And then these removal efforts continued after um, 2012 and in 2013 to 2015, effort was further decreased in the most downstream and most upstream reaches to apply more effort into the middle reaches. But, but this particular paper um, only covers uh, data analysis through 2012. So through that, that work, we found that common carp densities declined in all subreaches during removal. So I'll be showing this graphic for the next few slides. And what we have here is the left side represents um, the upper removal reach. This, the right-hand side is the downstream removal reach. Um, each row is um, a species life stage combination. So we have common carp on the top, channel catfish. Um, this next one, bluehead suckers, flat mouth suckers. And, and the, um, each panel, it's um, the catch rate on the y-axis and then through time along the x-axis there. And so common carp, um, they're much more susceptible to electrofishing. There's been consistent declines in their densities through time, but, but an alternate hypothesis is that this decline in, in common carp coincided with um, the disconnection of the San Juan River from Lake Powell as a result of the formation of Paiute Farms waterfall in, in 2001 or 2012. So it might be a little difficult to tease um, this effect solely due to electrofishing, but, but, um, but nonetheless, um, common carp uh, densities did decline during this, this time period. And, and I really won't talk much more about them since they're not the primary target of this removal effort. And, and over the last several years, the abundance of common carp has been lower than the endangered fish we're trying to re recover in the San Juan River. So we're not terribly um, concerned about them. Just jumping down to that next row, we have um, channel catfish juveniles and channel catfish adults. Uh, for the left and right pair on each of these sides, again, upstream reaches, downstream reaches. So channel catfish catch rates declined in only those most upstream reaches that experienced the most intensive removal for the longest period of time. And then finally, um, we looked at some native fish response to that non-native fish removal. So we used um, bluehead suckers and flannel mouth suckers um, because the numbers of pike minnow and razorback sucker were relatively rare during the time of this work. And, but we found that there was relatively little evidence of a positive response of these native fish to those non-native removal efforts. So kind of the, the, the summary of the work prior to 2016, we, we found consistent common carp declines across all reaches, but mixed or little response of channel catfish and native species to non-native fish removal efforts. And again, we acknowledge this being a retrospective analysis 
that didn't have a, an experimental design that likely made the assessment um, difficult to interpret. So um, in 2016 and 2017, um, in response to th that difficulty and seeing a response in that, in that previous work, um, we conducted, the, the recovery program conducted a two-year control treatment reach experiment. And the gist of that experiment was to compare between treatment reaches where we had removal and control reaches where we didn't have removal to assess the effects of non-native removal. So this, um, this um, slide here represents a schematic of that experimental design. So we used, um, there was the New Mexico Fish and Wildlife Service Conservation Office um, worked in the upper reach. The Utah Division of Wildlife Resources was responsible for this lower reach. And they conducted, um, they conducted removal um, by river mile split for each geomorphic reaches. So these black X's represent river miles where they conducted removal. And then these gray um, boxes represented control reaches where they simply uh, floated through removing no um, channel catfish, not doing any electrofishing. And that was, and that was again, split among the different geomorphic reaches from again, upstream to downstream. And then these red um, dots represent the, the fall monitoring effort we use to assess the um, impact of that removal versus control in every single river mile. And then just for spatial reference, this upper reach is around Shiprock, New Mexico, is starting around this river mile 150. And then this lower end is around the Mexican hat, Utah, around river mile 52 or so. So channel catfish were significantly smaller in removal reaches compared to control reaches. So these box plots here by those geomorphic reaches, you know, most upstream to downstream from five down to two, split by um, removal reaches and then control reaches. So these box plots represent the, um, the size distribution of channel catfish in those river reaches. And this is just for 2017. And in 2017, we had significant and consistent declines in, in um, the size of channel catfish through time in the upper reaches. And, and I neglected to point out in that earlier slide that the upper reaches received more removal effort than those lower reaches. So that's why we had to analyze those separately. So again, we had significant declines in size through time in 2017. And also we compared to, to, to really tease apart the effect of what the removal was doing. We compared the last removal pass and the last control pass on um, the, the size of channel catfish in those, in those two sampling efforts. And in 2017, we saw um, in four of the five removal reaches compared to the con their paired control reaches, there was significantly smaller um, size distribution of channel catfish. Um, in 2016, we didn't see any differences. And, and, and then again, the, the, the graphic is just showing 2017. There were no differences in 2016. And we think that was due to the a higher rate of movement um, that occurred in 2016 that I'll get into in just a couple slides. Also, we found that removal rates were too low to demonstrate an effect on channel catfish catch rates or abundance. So these, these graphics um, are, are representing um, just, these are just the upper reaches. So we have the reaches across the, uh, the y-axis here reaches three, four, and five from downstream to upstream. And the, the y-axis re represents the change in CPUE, that's catch per unit effort, between the first pass and the last pass for each river mile. And the, um, the, uh, the squares and then circles here represent the um, year um, treatment combination. So 2016 control and removal in this in the gray and black squares, 2017 control and removal in the um, in the gray and black circles. So what we expected to see, we wanted to see an effective removal compared to the control. So negative uh, differences for channel catfish and positive differences for pike minnow and for razorback sucker. And then we found um, there was no effective removal on catch rates for channel catfish and Colorado pikemen on those upper reaches, but a slightly negative 
effective removal for razorback suckers, co contrary to our, our desired outcome. And in the lower reaches that aren't shown here, there was no significant differences in, um, in, um, in catch per unit effort for any of the species. So again, there, there, there seem to be no effective removal on, on, um, ab on abundances either for channel catfish or native, native or the native species. And um, that was probably attributed in part due to the limited recaptures and again, movement among reaches. And then getting into that, that movement, um, we found that channel catfish movement varied by these different years. They, they, they significantly, they moved more significantly upstream in 2016, but not in 2017. So each of these panels is showing the reach along the x-axis from upstream reaches by treatment and control to C and the T down, downstream. So again, five is the most upstream, two is the most downstream. And then the, the y-axis is, is representing the rate um, of movement between the initial marking event of those channel catfish and sub subsequent recaptures of those fish. So again, as, as I mentioned, there was a greater rate of upstream movement in 2016, but 2017, we saw pretty limited movement overall, meaning that the fish were recaptured in the same reaches where they were initially marked. And, and overall, the, um, the hydrographs between those two years were relatively similar in terms of overall volume and magnitude. But in, um, in 2017, there was elevated um, um, discharge prior to runoff compared to 2016. So maybe that had some effect on, on how the fish responded in those years. So again, the, the, the overview of this control re reach, um, control treatment reach experiment, we were able to detect shifts in channel catfish size structure in some years, but channel catfish mo movements seem to obscure our ability to detect effects of non-native fish management when we applied it at these spatially explicit reaches. And so what we needed was a way to assess the population level effect of non-native removal on channel catfish in the San Juan River. And then, and then to do that, we used a population-wide modeling exercise. And this is that work um, that was headed up by Casey Penna. So um, the gist of this work was that our estimated removal rates were too low to crash the population through either growth or recruitment over fishing. So let's just focus on, on this left panel here to start because there's a lot of information here. Um, this, um, this black line with the dots around it represents our estimated annual size specific removal rates, or excuse me, estimated mean size specific removal rates for 2011 to 2015, with uh, the dots represent the upper and lower 95% confidence interval of um, our, our size specific exploitation. So that's, that is the removal rate by, by the size of the channel catfish. And what we did is we predicted combinations of channel catfish removal rates and then the minimum electrofishing size limits to cause either growth overfishing in shown in this gray line here or recruitment overfishing shown in this black line here. And um, the, the red dot is, is our, um, our, our estimated removal, mate, removal rate at the minimum size that we are effective at, capture, at capturing channel catfish in the San Juan. And simply these different panels um, represent the natural mortality of channel catfish in the system, which a number we didn't know, so we just estimated that a 15% annual mortality up to a 25% annual mortality. But, but nonetheless, at our estimated um, minimum size um, effectiveness removal rate, we were below growth and recruitment overfishing. So we're, we weren't applying enough, um, enough effort to increase the exploitation of, the, of this population to cause um, overfishing. Additional model results indicated that that nonetheless, um, that the, um, these efforts reduce the channel catfish abundance in biomass um, compared to an unexploited population. So again, let's just focus on, on one, of these, um, one of these boxes. So these, these isoclines represent the percent reduction in total number for the top panels or total biomass for the bottom panels 
of channel catfish with varying rates of removal modeled at different um, minimum electrofishing size limits. And then again, the, the different columns which just represent different degrees of natural mortality. So, and, and, and as you can see, I, I maintained um, that same um, estimated um, mean rate of size dependent removal that we observed in the San Juan from 2011 to 2015. And again, at our, at our um, minimum size that we were efficient at capturing channel catfish, we, we predicted that we had an approximately 40% um, reduction in total number and um, almost a 70% total reduction in biomass compared to a modeled um, unexploited fish population. And again, and then that effect of that uh, removal just declines with increasing um, levels of natural mortality. So stepping away from some of that model data and looking at some, some real observed effects that we saw in the San Juan River, we see that, um, that there was annual variation in channel catfish catch rates um, that were subsequent to the, the implementation of intensive removal efforts, suggesting that, that we are observing um, possible compensatory recruitment um, as a result of our, our removal efforts. So what we see in this figure is the total number of channel catfish removed on the left-hand y-axis and the catch rate of channel catfish in um, that was estimated during um, annual fall monitoring surveys through time. So again, the total fish removed is, are the dark closed circles, and then the catch rate of channel catfish is in these, um, these gray circles. So um, again, in the, in the, this, variation, this, this high level of variation in, in catch rates and number of fish removed followed the intensive um, implementation of non-native removal efforts through um, a larger section of the San Juan River after 2007 or 2008. All, but uh, um, another thing we were able to see from our, our, um, our observed data was that, that observed removal rates um, resulted in a reduced channel catfish length and mass over about, um, over about a a 25 year period from 1991 to 2015. So these box plots are the observed channel catfish total length in the top panel. So total length um, by time and then mass of individual catfish um, in the bottom panel through time. And then we saw, um, we saw that, that there were significant declines at the 50th, 75th and 95th percentiles um, over this period of time that resulted in um, reductions in the medium total length of channel catfish in the San Juan River declining from about 340 millimeters at the beginning of this, of this monitoring effort to about 246 millimeters um, in, in 2015. And in a corresponding reduction in mass from about 225 or so um, 20, 225 gram was the, was the median mass of channel catfish captured in the early 90s, declining to about 130 grams um, more recently in 2015. So all this, this modeling effort, it, 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 it showed us that exploitation at our observed rates wasn't likely to crash the channel catfish population, but it was having a significant impact on the size structure and the biomass at the at the removal um, intensity that we were applying. And um, just as a, some background, that, that level of, of, of financial commitment was about um, a half million to three quarters of a million dollars a year to, to, re, to observe or to, to attain that observed effect. So given that, that level of effort needed to achieve the observed and modeled cat, channel catfish re, response, the, the program asked, well, could non-native removal be conducted differently and get the same results with less effort? And that resulted in a 2020 and 2021 winter channel catfish removal summary. So we wanted to, to sample in the winter when there was lower turbidity and flow conditions. So we thought we would um, increase our catch rates of um, channel catfish during this, 
this time period just due to better sampling conditions. So this graphic here is showing um, removal rates for different time periods by, by, um, by length of channel catfish. And then the gray bars represent the annual removal rates that were observed between 2011 and 2015. The black line is just the mean of that 2011 to 2015 period when we were doing um, basically river-wide river um, intensive non-native removal um, in the San Juan River. And then in 2020 and 2021, we, we shifted these efforts to a smaller reach of river, just sampling in the wintertime. And the dotted lines for um, 2020 and 2021 in red and blue respectively represent the cumulative uh, removal rate bypass um, for that winter removal effort. So we, we, we see that, that that effort didn't match what we were doing in 2011 to 2015, um, leading to the conclusion that additional passes were needed in the winter to achieve removal rates that we observed um, from 2011 to 2015. And, and uh, the, one of the take homes from this was that the, the winter removal, the, the environmental conditions probably weren't as favorable as we initially had thought they were given that the water wasn't as clear and flows weren't as low as we anticipated when we were sampling um, in these two years. So to date, the focus of the recovery programs investigations have really been on um, the effect of non-native removal to channel catfish and native fish. But for the recovery program to be efficient in its recovery efforts, it, it wanted to, we, the Royal We, wanted to conduct our, our non-native removal efforts commensurate with the threat of non-native fish. So to do that, we conducted um, um, a diet study. Skyler had conducted a diet study in 2018 and 2019. And what he was able to do was determine the incidence of fish species and size of, of prey items for channel catfish in, in over 4,000 channel catfish stomachs. And he was able to estimate the total biomass and number of individuals con consumed by channel catfish, including consumption of Colorado pike minnow, highlighted there in, in the red. And, and so this work did provide an indication of the threat that channel catfish were posing on Colorado pike minnow. You know, it wasn't zero, they were eating some. We needed to we needed to evaluate how this threat was affected by the San Juan Recovery Program's um, non-native fish management efforts. So we did some modeling and some extrapolation to estimate the annual mortality pike minnow of pike minnow that was caused by channel catfish predations using the, um, the, the data from the, the Hedden et al. 2020 study. So we took all the important factors that hadn't identified, like temperature and turbidity um, affected both um, the number of fish and the amount of fish that, that channel catfish would consume. Um, this relationship is size specific, so larger channel catfish um, eat more um, fish. Um, and th this would also be affected by um, the number of the number of um, channel catfish represented in the system. So, we, so we built a model that represented a range of of possibilities. So we started off looking at um, the temperature crossed with the turbidity in three different years. So we crossed the temperature of of each year with the turbidity of each year as well to create nine different environmental scenarios. To represent um, a, an unfished, an, um, an unexploited channel catfish population in the San Juan River, we use the size structure of that fish before the implementation of intensive removal. Um, so we use a size structure that was represented by this population from 1991 to 1995. And then to represent the size structure of this population following exploitation, we used the, what that population looked like from 20. 13 to 2017. So, so that's represented by these um, these two lines showing the relative size structure of the black is the the exploited or fished population of channel catfish, and the red is representing that that channel catfish population that that wasn't being exploited. So there's two different there's an, a fished and an unfished scenario, and then we wanted to look at at um, how that 
how that was influenced by different size channel catfish populations. So we use the upper 95% channel catfish population from, from 2018, and then the lower channel catfish population estimate from 2018 to, to come up with, um, here's, here's what the scenario would look like at a high channel catfish abundance or a low channel catfish abundance that was applied to both the fish and the unfish population. So again, the, the, the red line, the, the red line from the, this previous panel is the unfish population. And then, then simply the two lines here represent that size structure at um, a high abundance and a low abundance. And similarly for the black, that's uh, representing the unfish population. So this resulted in there being, um, gave us the ability to predict the number of age one Colorado pike meadow consumed across 36 different um, environmental um, scenarios, across nine different environmental scenarios with, with two different size structures of channel catfish at two different um, population estimates. And that resulted in this, then the, the result of that work is represented in this graphic here, where along the y axis, we have the number of pike minnow consumed across the different combinations of temperature. So, 20, so 17C represents the temperature of 2017 crossed with the turbidity of 2017 and all the various permutations of crossing temperature and turbidity for um, an unex unexploited channel catfish population. So that's a channel catfish population with a size structure that it was unfished at um, a high abundance estimate is the top circle for all of these lines, and then a low population estimate represented by the bottom circle for all these, these matching lines. And then the black similarly represents that same um, effort for a fished channel catfish population. So, so basically the difference between the red and then the black here represents the effect of non-native removal on the number of Colorado pike minnow consumed. So we had an indication of how many pike minnow were being consumed, but um, but that, but but what effect did that have on the population? Well, to know that, we needed to have an estimate of how many Colorado pike minnow um, are available prior to that predation. And we really didn't know that, but so we had to make a guess. So we, we had abundance estimates for age one Colorado pike minnow, but they always occurred um, late in the year after predation would have already happened. So these these weren't representing the number of fish that were available prior to predation. So so we just made an educated guess and, and took this mean estimate of about a thousand and 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 uh, quadrupled it, you know, suggesting maybe four thousand was a reasonable um, start for the number of age one fish that were that were available in spring prior to predation occurring. So again, this so given that this this um, if we combine the results of the previous slide with um, these results here of the number of catfish available, we have the pr proportion that were consumed by channel catfish predation um, estimated in a few different scenarios given the number of fish available in the system. So again, the red lines represent um, an unexploited catfish population with high abundance and low abundance. And then the black represents an exploited channel catfish population at high and low abundances. So again, the difference between the black and then the red lines is the is is kind of the effect of non-native removal. And an important realization when we came up with came up with this is that it seems, at least through this modeling exercise, that the number of um, of Colorado pike minnow in the system sort of mediated the effect of what that predation uh, was doing to that population. So when the pike minnow population is low. The effect of predation is very high, but when the pike minnow abundance is very high, the effect of predation is relatively low. Now, granted, this approach had some limitations. It assumed that the number of pike minnow consumed was independent of availability. And then also, we conducted this extrapolation using the mean values, the mean parameter values from Hedden's models. So we revised this model to account for uncertainty around 
um, parameter estimates. And, and Matt Ziegler was really helpful in helping us um, conduct this modeling exercise where we accounted for parameter estimate uncertainty. But what it basically allowed us to do was to redo that whole modeling exercise, but accounting for, for more stochasticity in the, in the system. And, and we thought produced um, perhaps more realistic numbers for us. And the gist of, of redoing that modeling exercise is sort of summarized in this box plot here, where we have this difference. So this, these box plots represent the difference between the number of fish consumed in a fished versus an unfished scenario. So we call that the number of fish that were saved by doing removal across um, a few different um, scenarios. Um, the high means a high channel catfish abundance. And then the, the, there's two years here that represent extremes of temperature and turbidity that we put into that model. So we, we plotted that similarly to that other graphic showing again how the proportion of fish consumed varied, excuse me, through um, the number of age zero fish that were available um, in the system. And again, we're, we're comparing the two models here. So the um, the solid lines um, the solid lines represent the results of um, model one. The the solid red line is the number of or the proportion consumed in the unexploited channel catfish population in model one, and then the exploited um, in model two. And then the second modeling results resulted in lower um, numbers of fish consumed. But again, we see we still see that difference. Um, between the unexploited channel catfish population in model two compared to the, the exploited channel catfish population in, um, in model two. And again, similar results, but at lower, lower magnitudes of um, lower magnitudes of consumption. So there's been a lot of ongoing discussion within the recovery program about, about the modeling approach, the predation study, and also non-predatory effects of channel catfish um, on the population. Um, that, that results in lots of different opinions about, about this management action um, among reco recovery program participants. So, so, so what is the recovery program doing um, given this, this synthesis and the presentation of this information? So, well, one thing that we're doing is since a non-native fish symposium that was held about a year ago, the recovery program has decided to take a, a, a break from its typical non-native fish management efforts. So, so it was able to devote um, effort to increasing the efficiency of um, that management action, increasing the exploitation on, um, on channel catfish. So what it's doing to get at this is, you know, first of all, can others experience with channel catfish management or data we've already collected improve our efficiency? So, so to address that, we're funding a literature review and data synthesis. Um, secondly, can we focus our channel catfish efforts at a certain time of year or in a particular place of the river to improve efficiency? So to address that, we started a telemetry-based project to evaluate channel catfish spatial and temporal spawning patterns with hope of identifying the Achilles heel for future management efforts. And then um, finally, like, are, are there novel approaches that we can use to help crash the channel catfish population in the San Juan River? So we've, we've um, We've begun discussions to explore using a Trojan Y chromosome approach with the goal of skewing the population sex ratio to male that would result in eventually collapsing the population. But, but, but granted, we're in the very early stages of this and it would require the development of a YY male brew stock and also a long-term commitment. Another thing that we came away came away with is because the, the impact of channel catfish predation on Colorado pike minnow um, it's also dependent on the pike minnow side of things. So it seems like when there's more pike minnow out there, the effect of that predation would, would necessarily be lower. So we've made some changes to the, the Colorado pike minnow augmentation plan. We've shifted from stocking 400,000 age zero Colorado pike minnow to 12,000 age one Colorado pike minnow. Now stocking larger fish should reduce their susceptibility to channel catfish predation just because um, channel catfish are, are gape limited and age one fish, the older fish would only be consumed by the, by the, 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 the greatest 
sized um, cholera pike meadow in the system. So we, we, we think we would reduce the predation um, happening there. Another thing stocking older, larger Colorado pike meadow allows us to do is to implant them with a pit tag prior to stocking. That allows for two things. So we can distinguish pit tagged stocked Colorado pike minnow from wild spawn conspecifics. That's something that we've not been able to do to date. And it also allows those fish to be uniquely identified from the hatchery. So that allows us to be able to conduct hatchery enrichment experiments with control and treatment fish to hopefully increase the survival of these fish post stocking. And we've conducted some other work with Razorback Sucker that have found um, flow conditioning doubles the first year survival of those fish. We're optimistic of similar results for recently stocked flow conditioned age one, age one Colorado pike minnow in the system. Um, additionally, um, hatchery space is pretty tight these days. So we're, we're, we're exploring some experimental ways of trying to increase cholera pike minnow numbers in other ways, such as stocking eggs and larvae. And we conducted a pilot study to stock larvae this um, last spring, but we're still waiting for those results to come in to see if that was an effective um, technique. Now, I mean, honestly, at this point, you know, we really don't have a clear path for how we're going to proceed with non-native fish management at the conclusion of this hiatus that we've, we've implemented. You know, there's there's partners that have expressed um, expressed concern that the future is going to depend on the outcome of what we learned during this hiatus. And you know, some people would be happy to return to business as usual, but I, you know I don't think that's likely given the cost and then lack of effect we've shown to date for managing this species. You know we we could also implement some new strategies, but it's going to depend on the cost and efficiency of those strategies. So we'll have to kind of see how, how some of these other research efforts pan out before making those decisions. And then finally, um, if recent changes to the augmentation um, efforts results in increased abundance of Colorado pikemen in the system, in the absence of non-native removal, we, we could make a decision to abandon the effort altogether. Uh, the recovery program has really struggled to reach consensus on the magnitude of the threat posed by channel catfish or come to a conclusion about what we can do about that threat. So it's really, it's really hindered our ability to come up with what is the goal of this management action in the San Juan River. But we are actively um, trying to sort through these issues and discussions are ongoing to identify a path forward for the San Juan Recovery Program in its management of non-native fish species in the San Juan River. And um, with that, I'd like to say thanks. And if there's time for any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to try to address those. Thank you, Scott. That was that was a great in presentation and tons of really great information. Um, first thing is we did have requests for those uh, PDFs um, that you showed in the overview slide. Um, I directed folks to the case study, but I'm not sure if all of them are there linked in that one. So if you do have those handy, it would be great if you could pass those along. Um, and then so far in the chat, just one question. Um, this Real quick, was, Christy. Go for it. Can, can I send you those papers and could you distribute to the group after the presentation? Would that be, would that be okay? Yeah, we can do that for okay. sure. Cool. Yeah, and um, I think this was earlier when you were talking about the methods. Um, does that mean that smaller fish are more susceptible to electrofishing? And what were the largest fishes found? And Bradford, if you want to clarify um, any of that, feel free to jump on. So um, channel catfish were, uh, were more, the larger fish are more susceptible to electrofishing than the smaller fish. And so we were, we were once fish got below um, about 288 millimeters, our, um, our removal rate of those fish was really, really low, but we're, we're reasonably effective at removing large fish. But again, there's so many, there's, so, you know, little fish become large fish. We, we're, we're good at hammering big fish, but that just creates, seemingly creates more, um, more small fish out there. Awesome. Uh, Jess, do you want to unmute and ask a question? Sure. Hey, Scott, thanks for the presentation. Sure, um, thank you. Excellent. 
Um, quick question on the diet study. So I may have missed it, but I didn't see any diet um, study results for consumption of Razorback Sucker. Was that not part of it or, or were there no Razorback Sucker detected in the diet? The latter, there were no Razorback Sucker detected in the diet. But, okay. but to point out once, so there's, there's some, I, I kind of glossed over some of the, 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 the detail, the nitty gritty of the stocking program. So we stock um, Razorback Sucker at basically sub-adult sizes that are about a foot long when we put them into the river. So that's a pretty big fish for a channel catfish to eat. Um, and then again, we, 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 we document reproduction of razorback sucker pretty regularly, but we, but there seems to be a bottleneck between the larval and the juvenile life stage. And, you know, if channel catfish are eating, um, larval fish, like that might be pretty tough to detect in a, in a diet study, but nonetheless, um, we, we didn't pick up any razorback sucker, um, in, in those four and a half thousand channel catfish stomachs. Okay. Thanks. Sure thing, Jess. Any other questions? Uh, feel free to unmute um, or put one in the chat. We have just a couple minutes left. A uh, question just came through in the chat. Uh, do you remove other species um, or does the program remove them as they find them? Yeah, the, 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 the focus of the removal has been, historically has been um, channel catfish, but any non-native fish that are encountered are, are removed. But the, the abundance of those has typically been, other than um, in early days of the program, there were lots of common carp out there, um, but they occasionally catch um, smallmouth bass, um, um, bluegill, largemouth bass. There's a lots of there's lots of small-bodied non-native fish out there that, that we're not effective at capturing those with electrofishing. But when they do, those are removed from the system as well. Great. Um, and Scott, I don't know if you're if you're looking at the chat at all. Um, cool. Yeah. Just a oh, interesting. A suggestion. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. They were picking through uh, parts. Uh, you know, digest, partially digested fish in stomach. So that would have been, I think, uh, that seems like a pretty slick way of, of going about it rather than um, going through that kind of stuff. Thank you. Definitely. Okay, I will go ahead and close this out. Uh, I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, this webinar was recorded and as always will be available on our YouTube channel um, in the next day or two, where you can also find all of our previous webinars. Um, also feel free to check out uh, the case study from Scott, as well as any of our other 168 case studies. As Scott mentioned, our next webinar is uh, from Mark McKinstry um, from Bureau of Reclamation, who will be speaking about uh, the waterfall that acts as a fish barrier. Uh, that will be December 13th, and we should be sending that announcement out um, probably early next week. Um, if you aren't already on our mailing list and you want to receive these announcements, um, please just let me know and we'll get you on the list. But thank you all again for your time and especially for you, Scott, for giving this excellent presentation, and we hope to see you all again soon.